Welcome everyone to this evening's special sound investment salon. This is really a type of prelude to what's coming uh, next season and also uh, a check in with a few of our uh, lovely sound investment composers from previous years. Um, right now, you know, in this moment, we're really living between two seasons um, at a time when we would have otherwise been able to share really cool and interesting insights into what's coming with next, um, next season sound investment in person. We're taking this opportunity virtually to get to know next season's composer, Peter Shin. Uh, before we begin, I have a couple of things I want to share. Um, next weekend on Saturday, May 16th at 8 p.m., we will be uh, really having a uh, virtual concert that is celebrating the finale to this season. It's going to include some really special performances, um, uh, particularly uh, Beethoven's Third Symphony, Eroica, which was recorded a couple of years ago under the direction of Thomas Dausgaard. We'll have a piece, a special piece, a Rachmaninoff uh, cello sonata with Sheku Kanemesa and Isita Kanemason. We'll also have some cool interviews with Jaime, and we'll be even be premiering an excerpt from Derek Spiva Jr.'s Prism Cycles Leaps Part 3. Um, we'll have a few minutes of that as a special uh, virtual premiere. Uh, a lot of that, all of that information can be found at, on LACO's website, laco.org slash laco dash at dash home. Um, this virtual concert is also going to play a special role as we support our musicians and composers uh, as, we, as we begin to enter next season. Um, Right now in this current state, we've been very fortunate to be able to pay all of our musicians for canceled concerts this season. And we are taking as many steps as we can to make sure that we'll be able to continue that, um, that kind of support and engagement with our musicians uh, and composers as we enter next season. So that concert on May 16th will also be a fundraiser that is dedicated to the cause of supporting Lakos musicians. So a couple of housekeeping things about tonight. Uh, tonight's event will begin uh, with a conversation between uh, four composers who I know many of you know. Um, at about 7.25, we'll shift to a Q&A and those of us in the Zoom will be able to ask questions. There is a chat feature at the bottom of the screen. If you have a question uh, that you wanna pose to the group at any time, you can either enter the question into the chat, or you can just say, I have a question. And when we get to the Q&A part, we will uh, go through those questions in order. Um, spotlight you and give you the chance to ask the question um, in, on video and audio uh, to the group, and then we will uh, go that way. We plan to end the uh, program about eight o'clock tonight. Um, so, the quick introductions of the lovely people that are with us tonight. We have Ellen Reed, LACO's Artistic Advisor and Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, Ellen was the 2017-18 Sound Investment Composer uh, for her piece that pro, uh, the world premiere entitled Petrichor. We also have Sarah Gibson, LACO's 2018-19 Sound Investment Composer who premiered with LACO Warp and Weft just last year. I believe it's only been a little over 12 months. Yeah. Um, and then we also have uh, LACO's 2019-20, just the season we're wrapping up, sound investment composer, Juan Pablo Contreras, who mm -hmm. actually had to reschedule the world premiere of his piece, Lucha Libre, which will happen in a future season. Excellent. Of course, tonight yeah. we have Peter Shin, who is the rising 2020 slash 20 Cheers. composer. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Um, and also who is just about to graduate with a master's from Yale, which is a wonderful time to have great congratulations to him on that accomplishment and we look forward. Um, I think we also will have a few other sound investment past composers uh, with us tonight. I know uh, Matt O'Coin uh, was expected to come as well as Gernot Wolfgang, and we have a couple of others who will be joining us. Um, a big thanks also to all of the members of Sound Investment who have made all of this possible. 
Um, we are now entering our 20th year of Sound Investment, which is an incredible um, run for this uh, wonderful program. And it would not have been possible uh, were it not for all of the supporters who have been coming back year in year and supporting, as well as some of us who have really sponsored this program at much larger levels. So uh, thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to Ellen Reed. Hi, everybody. So wonderful to see you. Um, I want to ask a question, which is not appropriate, but who here is not wearing pants or shoes? <laughs> <laughs> For all of our panelists, just joking. Um, you know, it's so great to see so many faces here. You know, I miss everybody. I really miss the community. I miss the beautiful music that LACO makes, you know, and I'm just thrilled that we're able to make the most of what we can by having some exciting conversations. So um, for me, having the Sound Investment Commission was a huge opportunity. And the fact that you workshop it really allowed me to um, have music in my piece that I would have never had otherwise. I would have scrapped things. I would have, um, you know, like had to make a lot of different decisions about the piece. And there was this great freedom around um, the fact that we got to work with Laco really deeply on the work. And um, I was curious if this experience was uh, just personal to me. And when we were all talking the other day, it seemed like we all had parts of our work that wouldn't have existed, that wouldn't be living in this world had it not been for sound investment. And so I really wanted to hear from, um, from Sarah and Juan Pablo and about their sound investment pieces. So Juan Pablo, why don't you kick it off? Can you tell us a bit about a part of your piece that wouldn't have existed without this workshop process? And could you um, play a little bit of the performance of it for us, please? Yeah. Uh, so my piece is titled Lucha Libre. It's about Mexican wrestling and I had Basically, I chose six soloists within the orchestra to play prominent parts in my piece. And one of them was the timpani. And uh, he personified the character of death, La Parca. And I wrote a very intricate timpani par part that initially I imagined for five drums. But what was amazing is I got to work uh, on it with Wade. And he figured out that using six drums was even better and sounded uh, fantastic. So what I'll play for you is, is that end result. We worked together. We met one-on-one uh, -on -one a few times, which was incredible for me to be able to test things out and to learn more about how to write even better for timpani. So this is the result. This is the, the timpani solo. It's very melodic and this is what it sounds like. of the timpani melody and theme and yeah without that collaboration I wouldn't have dared to write something so intricate so melodic and, and to have that confidence to write something like that so that was one of the highlights of working with with uh, Leiko and specifically with Wade. That was so beautiful have you noticed in your writing I mean I guess that you're just off the heels of working on the piece but has that spilled into any of the other works that you're working on right now? Uh, not yet, not yet. Yeah, this was this is so recent. This piece is so recent that I'm still, yeah, growing out of it. But it, it was an amazing experience, and and especially working with or presenting it to the investors was completely life changing for me. Like having them involved in the whole process. I, I, I now moving forward, I want to write all of my pieces like that. You know, that's a luxury <laughs> to have a, a community to work with. You know, composers we work so isolated and alone that I, I miss having that feedback and that getting that advice and make it more of a collective experience, which was amazing for me. 
Yeah, well said. I think it comes that that experience somehow comes into the work that that yeah. we make during sound investment. Mm -hmm. Sarah, can you tell us about I I'm, I didn't haven't heard any of your piece yet, so I'm really eager to hear it. But tell us about something that was a discovery for you during the workshop process of sound investment. Absolutely. So. I had gone to Ellen's workshops and also had talked to you, Ellen, about, you know, like what your first reading was like. And I remember you just saying like, get as much as you can out, even if it's not like a finished piece yet, like just do as much as you can because you'll never get to try something like this again. And so I, I wrote just as much as I could, but I did go into it knowing, thank God I have this time to adjust, <laughs> you know, if something isn't quite right. So there's this one section, it's about two thirds into the piece, where um, I knew I kind of wanted it to be the emotional climax of the piece. Um, and I really wanted to use an oboe solo because I love Claire Brazau's playing so much and I had known her um, a couple years before and then just around LA. And so I was really excited to write this oboe solo. And when I got into the reading, I realized that the pacing was just all off and the like what I was thinking of as the heart of the piece was like 30 seconds in the like midst of the entire like 13 or 14 minute piece. So it was this section with solo oboe and strings. And what I ended up doing is actually making it about two minutes long, this whole section. So I quadrupled the size of it. Um, I added clarinet and I added timpani. I guess we both like working with Wade, Juan Pablo. <laughs> and, um, and then also it was, I think it was the third salon where I had the chamber ensemble um, that like I could pick like a quartet to work with. And I was able to get, I think it was a string trio and an oboe. And so I was able to not only hear the first 30 seconds of this with the whole orchestra, but then in the chamber workshop, I was able to hear a semblance of the full two minutes and work out all of like the, the string articulations and there's a lot of glissandi and some string effects that I just, had I not had that second workshop, I was working with like Armand and Teresa and they both just like held my hand through, this is the best way to write these effects. This is, you know, how you'll get these. I wouldn't do this at Forte. I'd do this maybe at like Mezzo Forte. And like, I, it was just like, and now I, I love this part of the piece and it's all due to both workshops. <laughs> so. That's incredible. Wow, I love that. Have you um, been able to take that and put that into the work moving forward? Or do you think that it's so specific to the piece that it's just basically I, applied to work and left? Yeah, no, I've actually like working on what I worked on with the string players in regards to articulation has really affected how I've put in articulation specifically for strings. Since then, I think I use too many accents because I'm a pianist. And so it's like more percussive. And for right. strings, I don't think that was translating the way I wanted it to. So I definitely, it's affecting how I'm right putting in articulations for players, for sure. Yeah. That's so awesome. Let's hear it. Let's listen. Okay. <laughs>
Ah, oh, that was so gorgeous. Right. So right. emotional. You really, you really got the string glissandi and I mean, it just sounds, sounds awesome. Was that really what you were picturing in your head? Yeah, it was, and it, you know, and still too, I mean, even just uh, Peter Ungen, who was conducting in the um, rehearsals leading up to the piece, he really spent a lot of time with that section too, and just like transformed it with the orchestra. And um, yeah, I mean, just every step of the way, it was just transformative for me as a composer, for sure. <laughs> That's so. awesome. Uh, so I'm going to share a little bit for, of my piece from Petrichor, and Sarah, I love that you you set me up for this so well. Uh, <laughs> it's true. I just I just thought because we had this reading that I was going to try to write as much as humanly possible just to hear it for for my workshop, and um, and so I did. I wrote like nonstop for this period of time, and just you know I was like. I had to turn in the piece to Laco the next day and I had stayed up really late and I had this idea, but I was like, this is just so basic. I'm never going to keep this, but I'll have something like this in the piece, but I'll just have it in there. Like as a, like, maybe do I even want them to read it part? And then I wound up, it was like, it sounded great. And it was so like some, it sounded so ethereal and simple and it's how I closed my piece. So had I not had a workshop, I would have never had like, the ending of the piece, which I think worked really well. It was like very simple strings that all surrounded the listener. And after like the journey of the kind of like wilder uh, build up to that like suspended moment, it, it, it worked. And that I wouldn't have had, um, I wouldn't have tried something so direct or so um, kind of straightforward, I guess, if I hadn't had a workshop, but that's, that's why you have workshops because with the perfect tuning and like beautiful playing of the players, you didn't have to do anything else. It just was already there. Mm. So we can play a little excerpt just from the very end of Petrichor. Awesome. So Peter, you know, we have, we can't hear, you know, you haven't had the sound investment experience yet, but you're, you know, your experience with workshops. I met you at a workshop for a room full of teeth and I was so blown away by your orchestral writing and um, all the work that I saw that I was so excited to uh, bring up your name at LACO and everybody was really eager to um, have you be the next sound investment composer. So I'm so glad it worked. We're so lucky to have you here and I can't wait to hear what you're going to do this year. But at this point, um, can you, um, I know that you have experience with workshops and that you built this super cool dance piece called uh, Screaming Shapes. Can you tell us a little bit about how the workshop process in, impacted making that piece and then could you share some of it with us? Yeah, uh, so in light of all of us having to adapt and innovate and put our heads together, um, I thought it would be really fun to share my most collaborative work, uh, which really opened up how I approach my music making. Um, so this particular workshop 
was through the Cohen Collective. And they paired three choreographers with three composers. And there was a playground of dancers. And it was a week long workshop. And the very first day, our first assignment was we had 30 minutes to come up with 30 seconds of music. And in another room, the choreographers had 30, 30 minutes to come up with 30 seconds of choreography. And then we would uh, hand it off to each other and then we would make to those 30 seconds. And so um, what I want to share with you is the first 30 seconds of that workshop. Um, and it was so wonderful. Our, my collaboration with Sophia Stoller, who was a choreographer, uh, she and I just found something so incredible and we wanted to finish the piece. And so that's, um, that's what we came up with, Screaming Shapes. <laughs> the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> that was so incredible wow um can you tell us about what, what were some of the sounds that we were hearing in that yeah um well I, when i was thinking about what single minute of music do i want to make my first impression with um it, it's a sort of an impossible task and under normal circumstances maybe i would have shared an orchestral work because it's late go um but i yeah, I thought that it would be fun to share um, this piece that really challenged the ways in which I engage with different mediums. And so um, a lot of it is electronic. Well, it's completely electronic um, in this sense, but uh, there is also um, an acoustic layer of live instrumentalists playing on top of the electronics, but the electronics are recordings of live performers. So it's this sort of tertiary, secondary level of uh, listening that I wanted to really highlight. Um, and so the re the electronic part is just a group of friends that I got together um, and we just jammed and I recorded uh, each individual player responding to a poem that one of uh, the instrumentalists had written. And so not only musically was it collaborative, but also in terms of the dance and also um, poetry. And it was one of the most fun experiences that I had. <laughs> Wow, I love all the different touch points. And uh, how long was the piece total? It's uh, about six minutes long. Yeah. Awesome. Have you continued a, a relationship with those dancers? Um, not those particular dancers, but we did uh, perform it a few times and they are working on releasing um, a filmed version of it sometime soon. Ooh. That's yeah. awesome. I want to watch it. I mean, the, the sounds are so evocative and I love how it all plays together. That's so great. Um, Peter, I want to turn it over to you to ask us some questions to get whatever kind of uh, feedback would be helpful or interesting at this point in the process for you. Yeah, I feel so lucky to have several generations of absolutely stunning and beautiful sound investment composers here in front of me <laughs> for me to squeeze out every last drop of wisdom um, heading into my own journey. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about collaboration. Um, we talked about how composers are rarely afforded an opportunity like sound investment to collaborate so deeply over an extended period of time and really get to know the musicians. And Sarah, I remember hearing how hands-on you were and in making adjustments and asking questions to the musicians in real time and just getting your hands dirty in that process. And uh, as a pianist and a champion of new music yourself with your piano duo, Hockett, um, you're often on the receiving end of a new score. Mm. And so, and you hinted at this already, but I'd love to hear what collaboration looks like to you and means to you and, and uh, with your unique experience as both composer and performer. Wow, yeah, that, um, so, it's hard to tackle in like one moment, but 
You know, I think like specifically talking about Laco, I think one of the things that I was constantly telling myself is that they're the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra and that like they're a chamber ensemble at the heart of their heart. Yeah. And um, that to me just helped bring collaboration to the forefront even more so for me that it was like any chance that you know, talking to players on the sidelines, going to their concerts, um, asking them what they're liking playing right now. That was always really exciting for me. Um, and I think that, you know, I was really excited, like in that, uh, I think the third salon that I was talking about where I had the chamber group, I did actually play a little bit in that with them. Um, I, I like made like a little bit of a piano reduction for myself and so that I could like hear some of, you know, the bass line or whatever wasn't there with the group that I had. Um, and I conducted it as well. And I think that that also, it just helped like put me in the middle of it. So I guess I did get my hands dirty, like kind of literally, but you know, I, I think that it was it was really fun for me that way too, because it just made it human. Um, and like we were all kind of playing in the dirt together, <laughs> even if it was dirt that I had created. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, everybody on the Laco stage, they're just so great with new music. And I it seems, I think all of us here have felt so welcomed into the Laco family that you know they're always going to answer our emails and they're always going to talk to us at concerts and they're always going to help us so i think just like one of my biggest things as a performer conductor is just that trying to just get rid of any sort of wall like it's just you're all trying to make music together and so you know the composers are just as much a collaborative force with them especially in this sort of process um, so I think it's just, you know, going in, knowing that you're part of the team, you know, yeah, in any yeah. case, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've already felt a sense of this open door policy. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I, like most orchestras that I hear of, you know, I've been told don't speak to the conductor unless spoken to. Don't even make eye contact with the performers. That'll piss them off. <laughs> like, this, <laughs> just, there's this wall that that doesn't seem to be there um, with Laco and- It's not there at all, yeah. Yeah, um, that's, yeah that's incredible. Um, Juan Pablo, you and I highlight in our music the importance of national identity. Um, and you with your Mexican heritage and me with my Korean American heritage, which of course manifests in completely different ways. Uh, for me personally, I am American first and foremost. I was born and raised in Kansas City to Korean immigrant parents. And so my experience really comes from a dual Korean American perspective and more broadly and more necessarily, I guess, from the Asian American diasporic experience. Um, just to give an example, in, I was recently commissioned by the Chicago Civic Orchestra to write a piece responding to the pandemic. And I decided to write a sort of quasi public service alert to Asian Americans, precautioning them about the thousands of reported attacks on Asian people around the world due to the scapegoating of this virus. And, but beyond highlighting issues important to my Asian American experience, I'm also contending with my relationship to Western art music as a person of color. Um, you know, I love Bach and Beethoven, but with it comes a painful history of cultural dominance that was forced upon Korea and really complicates my relationship with the Western art music that I've uh, been studying and that I love. And so in turn, my relationship to my Korean heritage is that of reclamation. Um, so Juan Pablo, what is your musical relationship to your Mexican heritage and how do you reconcile Western art music in your work? Ah, great question. And I, I think it's a, an ongoing thing. I'm still discovering ways to do that. I've been living in the U.S. for the past 15 years now. Um, so there's lots of things that I've enjoyed highlighting in my music and, and specifically with storytelling. I love telling stories about Mexico and just circling back to my uh, sound investment piece. I really use this 
as an opportunity to celebrate Mexico. And especially I knew that I had uh, five salons or uh, yeah, at least five meetings with 50 people that were supporting the piece. So I, I really wanted to use it as an opportunity to share with them my background, what, what I, uh, you know, find dear in my life and, and what I appreciate. And, and I, I did that through Mexican wrestling. That was my, my way, the key into that conversation with all of these wonderful investors. Um, and it was, it was a lovely journey. It was almost, I feel like almost like it was like writing an opera with them, you know, getting to know the characters, getting to know what each of these uh, Mexican wrestlers represented. And especially also getting to know the people that were supporting the piece and what they valued, uh, what, you know, what their uh, preferences in life were. And, and, and it was a very kind of organic um, collaboration with them as well. I, I think one of the, we talked a lot about the, the Laco performers, which, which are incredible and very open to collaboration. But for me, something that was very new about this, the whole process was this idea of, of the investors that are so involved in the composition and that are there with you since the inception and, and just having the privilege to take them on this journey with me felt like we all wrote the piece together. That's, that's how I felt that by the end, it, it was just, it, it wasn't me composing. It was, you know, 50 or more people uh, giving me input, feedback, and, you know, and giving me the courage to, to really experiment and go, you know, go crazy and, and, and bring this idea to life. So um, I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to have this uh, more collaborative re relationship with, investors with music lovers and it's something that we rarely can do as as a composer no we're, we're typically more in touch with the performers or we just composing on our own and just show up on the first rehearsal with an orchestra and just getting to know the community of the orchestra and and people who have been here for many many years for me was incredible so that's i saw that as a huge opportunity to you know, connect with them, tell them about my background, talk about Mexico, and in turn get to, get to know them at that deep of uh, a level. So, yeah, it was that that was my favorite part. I think Re really having that sense of uh, a communal accomplishment. Like I felt that the fact that I wrote this piece, which is the most you know uh, out there piece I've written, was thanks to everyone who who chimed in and, and gave me that that encouragement. So. I would say as, as an advice, you know, like use that to your advantage, use that process, the fact that you're gonna be able to communicate and collaborate with all of these wonderful people for six or more months to, you know, build that into the piece, into your ideas. But it's something that you can flesh out and, and uh, explore as time goes on. So you're in for a great ride. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just have one last question. Uh, Ellen, you've had such an incredible few years as a composer. And with that success comes an incredible opportunity and responsibility in championing the next generation of composers. Um, you know, the four of us are here because someone advocated for our music. And so Ellen, could you talk about what it looks like and what it means to have that responsibility of advocating for other composers so that people like our sound investors can get to know and support new voices? Yeah, I mean, I do, yes. So for me, it's just one simple question. What is the world that you wanna be living in? And that world, how can you reflect that world in the music that we're hearing? And for me, I wanna be living in a world that has a lot of different viewpoints, that has different ages, that has people who come from different backgrounds and who, that represent the, the multitudes and vast richness of, of the world. And so that it's pretty simple to look and say, okay, so who's, who's not here? Who do we need to hear from? And, and to ask those questions. Um, also, I work with Missy Mazzoli on a, a young female composer mentorship program called Luna Composition Lab, where we mentor five young um, <clears throat> 
female composers ages 13 to 19. And we help um, try to address the pipeline issue because uh, female composers are still majorly underrepresented. I think the stat is really depressing. It's like 10% of music heard on the stages by someone who identifies as a woman. Um, and we're 60 something percent of the population. So, you know, um, mm -hmm. so we're trying to address the pipeline issue um, by uh, working with these incredible young composers to help them um, get uh, training, have confidence and get fabulous recordings of their work to get into college. And we've had great success. Um, I was working with a composer this year who got into IU. Um, she's awesome. My composer last year got into Rice. We're like, we're slowly making progress um, and, and it's exciting and everybody's all for it. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it takes a village, but um, I'm excited about um, having more possibility to create the world I want to be living in. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I mean, yeah, this conversation really attests to the importance of reflecting our world and uh, uh, of the importance of living music. You know, I can't have these sorts of conversations with Bakker Brahms. And so <laughs> I am so incredibly thankful for the three of you bestowing your wisdom upon me. Um, and to and thank you to everyone at Lake Go for welcoming me to this incredible family. I can't, Woo! I can't wait. <laughs> we're so excited to hear what you do. Um, so I believe we're gonna open it up now for questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you. Um, just to just to recap, if you have a question, uh, you can put it into the chat. You can uh, also private message it to to Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra on the chat, and we'll we'll queue up these questions. Um, I also just want to say at this moment before we start, uh, this is this salon is really a, a, an in between prelude salon to next season. Uh, we will be doing um, three different salons throughout next season to prepare for the world premiere that Peter is going to have. And um, that's for our current sound investment um, members. If you haven't uh, renewed or joined, you can do that on the web at laco.org slash sound invest. Um, or you can also email me directly and I'm happy to help take care of that. So. Um, with that, our first question for tonight is from Raleigh Marcus. So we will turn it to Raleigh to ask that first question. Let's see. Uh, okay, so now I shouldn't be muted, right? <laughs> You're good. Okay, <laughs> great. So hi, everybody. So I really enjoyed the discussion um, and I thought it was really fun going through the, the roll call of the people that we've known for a few years. Uh, and, you know, we love them and it's really wonderful to see them again. Uh, but this time it was really interesting to hear a little bit about Peter, because I don't know his work. And so Peter, I was just wondering, I don't think we've ever used dance at LACO. Mm -hmm. Have you considered that maybe we should use some dance for this premiere you're working on? Um, if there, if there's a budget for it, um, that would be cool. <laughs> I mean, the more dance, the better, right? <laughs> right. You know, there's, there's, dance is not that expensive and there's got to be a way that you can incorporate some of the coal burn or, you know, it, there's a lot of dance in Los Angeles now. Uh, but it seems like you like that. Um, yeah, I mean... Ellen and everyone at LACO have been incredibly supportive in letting me be as creative as possible in creating this piece under these circumstances. You know, I was originally slated to write a piece for the Chamber Orchestra, but um, now I get a chance to really think creatively um, and bring something really special to the table. And dance is obviously something I really love, and uh, but I love other things too. And so it's, I'm really, I'm trying to narrow it down. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you. All right, Mike, do we have another question in the queue? Um, Gordon mentioned that he had a question for Peter, and I'm looking for Gordon here. He still has a question. Dude, 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 dude. Here we go. You still have a question, Gordon. I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, 
I didn't realize that uh, how preliminary this salon was, but uh, I'd like to ask Peter, what thoughts does he have about his composition at this point? Yeah, uh, uh, well, with the status of the world um, comes with uh, <laughs> the sort of uncertainty of um, what I am even allowed to do. And so I, I, I'm still thinking um, one possible avenue that I've thought of is, you know, I mentioned before that, that my Korean heritage is important to me. And um, I've always wanted to work with um, Suyeon Le, who's a Hegem player. It's a Korean traditional fiddle. And I think she's here tuning in right now. Um, but that, yeah, I would love to collaborate with her. And um, obviously I want to keep it Lego focused, um, but they're very uh, open to bringing in, you know, like I mentioned dance, dancers and um, people of other, uh, disciplines to this table. Thank you. I'm looking forward say, to it. And, oh, sorry to jump in. Um, and Brandon, you can speak to this more, but that, uh, you know, Peter is going to have a first salon where he shows a lot of his work. And so this is a whole other thing. So for those of you who really want to see more of Peter's work, there will be a time for that. Um, so Absolutely. we're not, yeah, there'll yeah. be a time for that. We, we, this is the first time that yeah. I know of that we've had this kind of a salon, not even counting the virtual yeah. part. I mean, it's actually the second virtual salon we've done because we did one with Juan Pablo a few weeks ago. But um, this, this is really a, let's get to know where we are or who we are and where we're going. And um, we will have that next salon will be kind of a, a look at where the composition is at that moment and also other work that is uh, define sort of a style or, or, or an inclination. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think we, we have another uh, question in the queue. Um, this one's from Ray Lowe. We'll get to you, Ray. Let's see. Uh, okay. There we go. I will, uh, gee, and I, and I typed it out so nicely too. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, two-part question. Um, for a poll for the composers on the uh, thing. First, the question is, do you consider high quality orchestral sample libraries to be an essential tool of your craft? And regardless of whether you, how you answer that one, the second part is what does a live ensemble do for you that those samples cannot? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> Should we all just uh, dive in? Um, I in don't. Of, uh, yeah, you should answer in order of your height. So you go first. Uh, <laughs> or last. You don't know how tall I am on Zoom? Come on. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a professional sample library. Uh, and I do uh, work with film. Uh, but for those purposes, I uh, work with living people. I find it more more meaningful. And if I need something that is, uh, I never had to do anything where I needed a full sample library. Um, mm. And I mean, what the living ensemble or like what the live ensemble does, it's, it's something spiritual. It's something that is uh, like pierces your body and and impacts all of your cells. So I, I think there's something like so incredible in that um, physical and visual experience that is just singular. Um, like after Laco plays a piece, who doesn't feel different? Yeah. You know, just like the pure tuning of it just does something to you. Yeah, I can jump in on that and say I second everything Ellen just said. <laughs> Um, and I don't have a professional sound library either, and I'm kind of glad I don't because I think that it it would give me I, I don't know I I don't ever want to feel like I only need a computer, <laughs> and because again that that breath literal breath in so many cases that people put into music. Um, 
it's transformative. And I think the best kind of analogy would just be, would you rather listen to a CD or would you rather go to a live performance? Or like, would you rather listen to, you know, a computer like library sound of Beethoven five, or would you rather listen to Laco play mm -hmm. Ellen Reed? <laughs> you know, it's like, but I, I think that it's a similar sort of thing that being there in person is just a different thing altogether. Yeah, and I think uh, the score itself, the, the scores we write are only like 70 or 80% of the information, you know, the, the, the performers get that score and interpret the music. So there's a lot of information, a lot of nuance, magic that they add to that score. So it's just, we're, as composers, we just do one part of the, of the process, no, we write the recipe, but then we give it to the chefs and all of these ingredients that bring in so much life and so much energy that we, I mean, they always surpass our, our imagination. So there's so much hidden magic that they bring to life that it's, you know, I don't think a computer can come even close to, to what uh, musicians, especially Leiko, add to a, to a score. No? Yeah. I. I can't afford a high quality sample library. So no to your first question, <laughs> um, at least legally. Um, and then um, uh, to your second question. Yeah, there has to be a feeding off of each other um, for my music to thrive. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, I, th I think we have another question hand went up from Leslie Lassiter. Uh, Leslie, do you have a question for us? Let's unmute Leslie. Someone should be singing. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute her, but not having any luck. Okay. In the meantime, uh, I have a question for Ray. So Ray, is you can unmute buy yourself. all of a sample library? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> So you're going to buy us all sample libraries? Is that? In, uh, um, no. But, Our own personal but, orchestras. In the, in the spirit of salon number one, which is something of a teaser, um, that doesn't mean that um, my efforts couldn't result in all of you getting said tool. Ooh, teased. Mm. Cheers. Relates to some conversations we've had earlier, Ellen, yeah. which have been put on hold for the current crisis, but which will resume. Wow. I Ellen, believe we put him on the spot. <laughs> I believe we should be able to hear Leslie now. I think that Leslie's unmuted. Can we? Can you speak, Leslie? Yeah, but I don't have a question. Oh, your know. hand. Your hand was raised. So I don't know, but I, I'm having terrible. I, I'm having issues. I can't see any of you. I don't know what my problem is. Oh no. That's okay. At least you can hear us. I can hear you. And I was trying to push buttons, so maybe that's what happened. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, nice we, to hear uh, your voice, Leslie. Yeah. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm glad to confirm, we have a couple of other past sound investment composers with us. Um, Gernot Wolfgang is here, John Steinmetz is here, and Matthew O'Quinn is also with us. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Um, would Brandon, you could, could we ask them to say yeah. a, few, a few words Please. about, to kind of just um, whatever dovetail maybe on what the others had said earlier to hear their feelings about their experiences in sound investment? Because they, they go I back a little bit longer. Absolutely. Yeah, I think Matt Coin uh, uh, went to bed because he's on the East Coast. He yeah, I think so too. It's late. So, <laughs> yeah, so I would love to hear from everyone else. Yeah, sure. Um, so at the time when I was, uh, can you hear me? Not very well. You're a little quiet, Gernot. Sure. Okay, how is this? Better? A little better. A little better. Okay. So uh, at the time I was a um, sound investment composer with Leiko, we didn't have orchestra workshops. So we had uh, wonderful meetings. And uh, some of the highlights of the meetings were that um, I ended up making friends for life with some of the investors, which is uh, priceless, wonderful experience. And, uh, but for the piece itself, there really wasn't much of a chance to workshop because uh, 
the first work was done in, in, the, in the first rehearsal. And uh, of course, Jeff and uh, the orchestra were focused on winning the piece and uh, getting it in the best shape possible. So uh, I had a few opportunities to uh, relate to Jeff what my ideas were. And usually it was via email after a rehearsal and Jeff wrote back and said to incorporate it. And the performances turned out to be great. Uh, the two things that I took away from uh, the experience of the piece was that I wished that I, I had made the big hits bigger in terms of orchestration. I was a little modest about it. And also, uh, my piece was uh, a kind of variation, a, a chain of interconnected variations about one theme, which was the Santa Ana piece. So everything was related and um, thematically. But um, after a little while, um, you know, letting, sit, letting the piece sit for a little while, I, I realized I could have probably done a smoother job with some of the transitions. So those two things were the, the things that uh, uh, I took away from it and uh, I was able to incorporate the inside of the other pieces. Awesome. Hi everybody, I'm John Steinmetz. Um, and I had the similar experience to Gernot in that, and I'm really glad to hear how the program has expanded the amount of contact between the composers and the orchestra, as well as with the investors. I had three meetings with the investors and during those, the first meeting I talked about uh, what I was thinking about. I think I had some very early sketches that I maybe played for them. The second meeting was with the chamber ensemble, a little bit like what some of you um, talked about. So there were key instruments from my piece that played some of the material. And I was working on a bassoon concerto, so the soloist was there, a couple of percussionists, and some other instruments. And so it was a chance for me to hear a little bit about how things fit together. But I think, um, at that time, the, the best thing about the process was the, the chance to meet with the, the investors and people who were going to be members of the audience and to see how interested and excited they were about this piece that was developing. The third meeting was at the dress rehearsal. So uh, the orchestra had rehearsed already and then the investors came to the dress rehearsal and got to hear the piece that they had been hearing about. And it was great experience to be able to talk with them at all these stages and see how uh, their experience of the piece fit or didn't fit with what they had been expecting based on what I had said and what they had heard before. And that, that experience certainly convinced me that this is a fantastic process that among many other benefits is cultivating people who are really interested in new music in a deep way, who really want to know how these things are made and what's on the minds of the composers, who I think in, in the course of doing this, learn also more about the musicians and how the musicians relate to the music. As far as relating to the orchestra, I had an advantage because I had been an orchestra member before that. So I was a bassoon player in the orchestra and there were still a lot of people in the orchestra who I knew. So it was wonderful to come back and, and work with them. But as Gernot said, it was, that first rehearsal was a little bit scary because we hadn't had any kind of workshop of the full orchestra piece. And everything went well, but I remember at the end of the first rehearsal, I had one of the worst headaches of my life. And I, I hadn't been aware of it during the rehearsal the moment the rehearsal was over, I got this headache and I realized, oh, I see, I've been holding back stress this whole time while they've been rehearsing. And the worry was unjustified. They played it beautifully and it all sounded nice, but um, that was an amazing experience to dive into the deep end with the new piece, which actually is the normal experience that composers have with orchestras with a new piece. They don't usually get this kind of workshop experience. So I'm delighted to hear that it's all expanded. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two more questions for tonight and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, 
our next question is from Jennifer Diener. So we'll turn our spotlight over to her. Huh. Hi, Hi, Jennifer. Hi. I'm sorry, I couldn't figure how to get it into the written format here. That's okay. I'm, I'm curious, um, what is it like to hear your piece or pieces played for the first time in front of a large audience? I appreciate the collaborative thing that you've been talking about and how it affects you as uh, writers, but I've, I'm in the audience, I'm in a large audience and I hear these pieces and I'm going like, what is it like for the composer to hear that? And how much um, does the audience contribute to your experience of your own music, if at all? That's a great question. Um, for me, it's terrifying to have the audience there you know it's like it's like the worst you know like anxiety dream but you're living it um but because the listeners are so open i didn't feel like there i didn't ever feel like there was a judgment on what i wrote which was so freeing and i think that if i had the same experience to do again i would it would not feel like an anxiety dream it was only in the fact that I was just getting to know the the sound investors and then all of a sudden it was like a, a very large, very rough thing that wasn't, it was really unwieldy. Um, yeah, that was, that's how I feel about it. For me, it's very exciting. I mean, I've, I, as, as Ellen said, it is nerve wracking, but I've developed an, an enjoyment. I mean, I've gotten used to hearing my own work with an audience. And I think the audience just adds to that excitement. So it's always interesting to see how people are reacting to things. And that energy, I think, translates between the performers and the audience. So it's, it's always interesting to see your, your piece performed on different venues and with different audiences and how that synergy happens. And, and yeah, I'm always fascinated by that. And I always learn a lot you know, just by observing people and seeing like where people were most excited or more quiet. So it's so there's a, a lot of learning for a composer on a premiere and also on each performance. I think, yeah, we, we take a lot of, there's a lot of feedback implied and, and, and that, that we can really learn from. So yeah, it's, I think it's the best part. It's the, the icing on the cake, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's similar. It's very overwhelming. Um, I mean, everybody in that room is hearing the piece for the first time, <laughs> you know, and, and that's like quite a task for every single person, you know, to process all of those sounds at once. Um, I, I think as a composer, you know, it's trying to figure out like, how to take notes and also how to be verbal and make sense, <laughs> you know, to, and, and how to like um, piece these ideas. It, it's, you know, speaking of the computer sound libraries, however much we might not rely on them, we have listened to MIDI playback at some point and, and, and every time it's going to sound wildly different. And so then it's like, oh, that didn't sound like what I thought it would. Did it sound better? What did I do that didn't sound right? Was it, was this too loud? Did they just need to do it again and play it a second time? And maybe they'll understand the rhythm better this time. Or was that my fault? Or that, you know, it's like these endless amount of questions. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's all just in the spirit of learning together, which is a really beautiful thing. And however much you can digest in the moment is more than we normally have, which is really exciting. Yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, I think, and so this gets us to our last question, and I just so love this question. It's a lovely way to end our evening together. Um, from David and Claire, uh, we'll spotlight you. Would you like to ask this question to the, to the group? Well, being big fans of Desert Island Discs, we love when wonderful creative geniuses are asked, if you were marooned on a desert island and had a choice of one disc, what would you have for the composer? <laughs> one composer. Yeah. One composer. One composer. Oh, God. <laughs> one composer, I, I would say Debussy. I would think. Okay. Debussy. Excellent. I would, 
Yeah. And? I, you know, it's really hard to choose one, but I'm just going to, I have this photo of Bjork that's on my wall. <laughs> so I'm just, I might just take the photo of her and, you know, her, her essence might follow, but I she's love definitely up there for me. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. And? <laughs> I'm going to say, oh man, it's so hard to like think about like the different, like, things. I, if I had to pick a composer, I, I think that I would pick Ravel because that was like my favorite piano music to play. And so I think it would just bring me back to like a, my childhood in a way. <laughs> Very good. Peter. Peter. <laughs> oh God. The last word. Can I, can I, can I just die on the, the <laughs> island? <laughs> You can bring John Cage. Yeah, <laughs> oh, oh, okay, yeah. sure. And sure. John Cage. Silence. That's what I want. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ooh. Thank you so much for the answers. I think I would go with Bach and the Rolling Stones. There you go. Uh, hey, you got wait, two. I'm hey, sorry. That's two. You said that's one. two. That's, that's cheating. Two. That's two. <laughs> you said one. <laughs> oh, one. Okay, Bach. There you go. Well, Thank you all so, so very much for joining us tonight. Uh, a big thanks to all of our Sound Investment supporters. Um, I just want to remind everybody one more time, the website to get more information as we come up to next season with Peter and we get our salons scheduled so we can, uh, so you cannot miss a moment of it. Go to laco.org slash sound invest. Um, and also, please mark your calendars for May 16th, a week from Saturday. That will be our big celebration virtual concert to uh, end this season. So join us again. And really, thank you to everybody for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. 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 Bye, everyone.